This is the story of our universe. It has taken humans millennia to meticulously reconstruct this tale of time, temperature, and entropy. You will hear about a continuously expanding and cooling universe. Our story starts at almost perfect physical order and ends in an infinite disorder. In other words, it ends in infinite entropy. 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 Ten to the minus 43 of a second is the age of the universe when we start. That's 0, 0.00 followed by 40 more zeros and a one of a second. The first memory of our universe is of rapidly expanding space. Here, expanding space means that different points are flying apart with a speed beyond human perception. This not so big and soundless bang is happening in a tiny fraction of a second. So to make it easier, we should narrate it in extreme slow motion. This first expansion is not just fast, it is exponential. This means that any two points in space are moving further and further away from each other, faster and faster. The accelerated inflation of space itself is being fueled by an unusual energy field. We call it the inflaton field. This process and this very brief era in the history of the universe are known as cosmic inflation. The first memory is of inflation, during which space is filled with fluctuating blobs. They are simply those parts of space where the inflaton field is densest. They are actually teeny tiny. They're tinier than anything we could ever hope to observe. The idea of blobs is an imaginative metaphor for what is formerly known as quantum fluctuations. They're called quantum fluctuations because they're governed by the laws of the field of physics called quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics describes our subatomic world. In our present cosmic time, such blobs are always borrowing energy from the universe and returning it immediately. This way, they enter and exit existence from one moment to the next. But back here in our story, during this primordial inflation of space, the blobs get to keep the energy they've borrowed from the surrounding space because they're quickly inflated by the exponential expansion. And thanks to this, they remain in existence. In this crucial moment of creation, cosmic inflation is preserving the primordial quantum fluctuations. You'll see. As the story develops, the blobs will trigger forces of gravity, 
that will lead to the formation of galaxies and stars, enabling the appearance of planets and life. Our primordial universe happens to be awfully hot and dense. When it is born, the conditions are so extreme they would be entirely unsurvivable by living beings, or even by matter itself. However, in our universe, just like that soda that you forgot in the freezer, expansion and cooling go hand in hand. In fact, Inflation expands space so quickly that in a tiny fraction of a second, the temperature of our universe drops by a factor of 10 billion. The inflaton fuel is now depleted. It no longer has enough energy to expand space exponentially. Not even close to a second has passed in our story. The universe is still only 10 to the minus 32 of a second old. In this short time, it has expanded from nothing to roughly the size of a grapefruit, and cosmic inflation is ending. A phase transition is coming up. It will be the first of many. Each will shake up the universe and increase its entropy, increase its disorder, and dramatically alter the cosmic landscape. The cause of these transitions between different states of the world, even of physics, will simply be a continuing drop in temperature. You see, as cosmic inflation slows, suddenly the entire inflaton field starts to oscillate. This oscillation causes the inflaton to turn into billions of inflaton particles. So, where quantum blobs were before, slightly more particles are produced. These inflaton particles are the big and heavy granddaddies of everything, but they are very unstable. So, they will very promptly break up into a soup of brand new subatomic particles. we've entered a new world. Two phase transitions are ahead of our new subatomic particles. Each will make the universe look more familiar. The first of these phase transitions is called baryogenesis, the creation of the matter world. Half of all the soup particles now belong to the familiar matter that we can see, hear, smell and touch. The other half are their antimatter counterparts. Just like the quantum blobs, the matter and antimatter are subject to the laws of quantum mechanics. They're borrowing energy from the universe to exist, they have to return it and be immediately reabsorbed. This can happen again and again because for now, the universe is hot enough. But soon, the expansion and cooling destabilize the energy exchange between the universe and the particles. As energy should get returned to its rightful owner, the fairness, the symmetry between matter and antimatter is broken. In the hot yet cooling blaze of the primordial universe, antimatter must suddenly pay back its energy debt, and all of it is destroyed. Meanwhile, matter cheats its way into survival. A few of its particles prevail. Let's talk about these thieving matter particles. They belong to two general families. The first family are the building blocks, the little electrons, and the heavy big guys, the quarks. The second family of particles are the messenger particles, called gauge bosons, who carry the four fundamental forces of nature. For example, the messenger particles of the electromagnetic force are called photons, the particles of light. 
We can play around with all these particles, not just in virtual reality, but also in real, giant machines called particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. The second of these phase transitions is called nucleosynthesis, the formation of atoms. Now we are looking at the universe still only a millionth of a second after we started. The temperature of the particle soup is 10 trillion degrees and still falling. But it has now become too cool for the big heavy quarks to keep flying around independently. They huddle together like penguins in winter, and in groups of three, they are joining into familiar compound particles, protons and neutrons. The protons are now comfortable and stable, and so most remain solitary forever as atomic nuclei of hydrogen. But the temperature keeps dropping. In the next minute and a half, it reaches roughly a hundred times that of the core of our sun. Now the universe becomes too cold for neutrons. As a consequence, Every single neutron seeks out the nearest protons and they too huddle together into the atomic nuclei of helium and lithium. This is the first occurrence of nuclear fusion and it lasts for another minute and a half. The saga of the creation of matter ends when the universe is only three minutes old. Let's zoom out now, from the microscopic scales of the particles to astronomical scales. And let's change pace. So far, we've been going in extreme slow motion, but now let's kick it into high gear. Remember the quantum blobs that became clouds of particles? Well, during the creation of matter, their overdensity was generating an immense pressure and while we weren't looking, this pressure has triggered explosive sound waves, or acoustic bubbles, if you prefer. And now, the pressure is propelling our bubbles through the universe. While I speak, the bubbles are growing from microscopic to astronomical sizes. You can think of what you would see as a pattern from pebbles falling into a pond, although more of a multi-dimensional pond. This pattern of overlapping acoustic bubble shells will now echo through the still expanding and cooling universe for the next 400,000 years. During this time, our particle soup is cooling to an appetizing temperature of 3,000 degrees, the melting point of diamond. For the first 400,000 years of cosmic history, the clouds of the bubble pattern have been glowing because they've reflected the photons of light. But after gently glowing for 400,000 years, the clouds are now reaching a new chemical balance and they're setting the photons free. And in doing so, the acoustic bubbles have now lost the pressure that propels them. They are freezing into a state of clear, transparent darkness. From this moment on, the liberated photons travel freely and carry with them a crystal clear photograph of the universe when it was merely 400,000 years old. You can actually take a look at this real composite image if you like. You see, we have learned how to scan the sky for these ancient free photons. The only problem is that you can't see this light in the sky with the naked eye 
because it belongs to the microwave part of the spectrum of light. Our human eyes just can't pick it up. We call it the Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB for short. We have a picture of this taken in 2013 in ultra-high resolution with the European Space Agency space probe called Planck. This image is one of the most important pieces of evidence in astronomy. So, the first episodes of our story lasted only fractions of a second, then minutes, and then we took a giant leap of 400,000 years. The upcoming episode is an era of 100 million years. The density and temperature will slowly drop from dramatically above to below human comfort. Next, I invite you to enjoy the Dark Ages. Nothing is immune to the pull of gravity. During the Dark Ages, seemingly nothing happened. But slowly and inevitably, the clouds of our dark, frozen acoustic bubbles woke up. Like a tumbling snowball, the densest points among them have pulled and accumulated the matter surrounding them. This process has fragmented the bubble shells into smaller clouds of gas. With the help of gravity, the clouds will now spectacularly collapse and become the first stars. You see, the collapse is compressing and reheating the densest clouds to millions of degrees Celsius again. In them, the first stellar cores are igniting in nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is hitting the cosmic light switch. Nuclear fusion makes the difference between a cloud and a star because it fuels starlight. But that is not all. Not only does nuclear fusion switch on the cosmic lights again, it allows two major heroes to be seen in our story on two very different scales. On the small scales, under pressure, inside the first stellar cores, some of the primordial hydrogen and helium are fusing together into the first atoms of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Eventually, some of these new atoms will make it into organic molecules here on Earth. Our small-scale hero are the atomic building blocks of life. On the large scale, individual stars are imperceptible. Condensing under gravity, stars are forming in groups of billions from the most massive clouds. These groups orbit around their own centers, many of which contain the most massive bodies in the cosmos, black holes. We know these groups of stars as galaxies. Galaxies are born cradled by gravity they form in collapsing clouds, condensing where the density is highest. We spot them in two types of overdense locations. As expected, they can be seen in the now gigantic, fragmented, yet still overdense shells of the former acoustic bubbles. But they can also be found in the centers of the bubbles, where so far we haven't seen much action. And this raises the question, whose gravity cradles those central galaxies? What if, the whole time, another type of matter was present? Its gravity would be competing over the surrounding material with the pull of the bubble shells. This matter couldn't possibly interact with the photons of light, 
otherwise we would see it. We couldn't emit light, nor absorb light, nor reflect it. We call it dark matter. Even though we don't see it, we believe it's there. Its gravitational pull is everywhere. Throughout cosmic history, dark matter hid in the background, giving the rest of the universe a gradually increasing gravitational pull. While our particle soup was exploding into acoustic bubbles many years ago, dark matter stayed in the locations of original overdensities, the quantum blobs. In our cosmic tail, in the largest blobs of dark matter, gigantic superclusters of thousands of galaxies are forming. Galaxies are just like shining droplets of water caught in an invisible, dark, cosmic web. We have arrived to present time. Today, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Its average temperature is only about three degrees above absolute zero. And most cubic meters of space contain only a few subatomic particles. Although, of course, the gravity of our solar system has deposited much more matter to make the Earth, for example. The pattern of blobs and bubbles is to some extent still collapsing under gravity. But the collapse has started slowing down. The last giant superclusters of galaxies have already formed. When we look up at the night sky today, we see planets, we see stars, and if we're lucky and the light pollution is low, we can see the fuzzy band of light that is our home galaxy, the Milky Way. If we want to see further, we use telescopes to survey the light from beyond our galaxy. If we do that, we can see millions of other galaxies out there. With cutting-edge astronomical telescopes, we make three-dimensional maps of the distribution of distant galaxies. Projects like the Dark Energy Survey, the BOSS survey, both from 2015, and soon the DESI survey and the Euclid Space Telescope are mapping out billions of galaxies, billions of light years away. When we look carefully at such maps, we can still detect the faint pattern of the acoustic bubble shells formed in the first 400,000 years of our story. When we gaze far away into space, what we see is the past because the photons of light simply need time to reach us. Actually, all these distant galaxies seem to be flying apart at huge speeds. That is because they're anchored in space and space is still expanding. So all these distant galaxies look like they're running away from us while throwing photons our way. We observe and catalogue the speeds of billions of distant galaxies. When we do so, we notice that we are missing another piece of the puzzle. Distant galaxies are indeed all flying away from us, but they seem to be going much faster today than they were in the past. It turns out that just like during the birth of our universe, there may be another strange energy field present today. It would have similar properties to the primordial inflaton. Some call this energy field vacuum energy, the energy of empty space. Others simply call it dark energy. Whatever you name it, it looks like less than four billion years ago it started to accelerate the expansion of space for the second time. As time passes and the universe expands, the already diminishing densities of light and matter will become negligible. All stars will die and galaxies will spiral towards their central black holes. 
Eventually, all matter will either fall into black holes or become so diluted it will effectively disappear. The universe will become cold and dark. The only objects around will be extremely rare, supermassive black holes, slowly radiating away their bodies and adding to the total cosmic entropy. And the universe will remain in its expanding, bleak, and desolate darkness forever, darkness. forever, darkness. forever, darkness. forever, darkness. forever, 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 such and such you like to be skated razored in laced delights bold in the cold heave ice giving of dares and giving protest need the melt where these a field of fossil floods soul in solemn divides intransigent loving once watching cubs birthing warm, lakey dreams in the hour of half temptation. Yellow rose, so it burns in our world's turn. Wild away to my breast of time, the bees loving you, extending the free universe of diabologies. Hey, song in me, whistling to scold the sleeping sun. Oh, nights in your kingdom. Cream shade, death, delight. Yeah, I've been lost in it, lost.